TSG! South Bedrock represent. Here we are. Coming on in. As they say in the commitments, say it once, say it proud. I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I need a saxophone to go to really bring it home. I'm just saying. But, you know, best, best, best stab I could make at it here. This is Josh the Birdman coming in for you here. For We have assembled once again on, the, on my glorious February day here. <laughs> in the best that New England can offer here in February, without a doubt. Coming on in on the round table down in the steam tunnels. Just joined here by my fellows, of course, my, my beautiful fellows. Rashawn Smith, the three of clubs, how are we doing today? What it do? Doing well. Um, it's funny taking on to a, a earlier part of our conversation, and it's funny that you use the Scottish uh, accent, or if we're going to call it that. Sorry. I mean, Scottish. it was meant to be Irish, but of course it comes out of Scottish. Oh, my God. Don't say that. Uh, you okay. you probably could have been okay if you just went. Shut the fuck was, up. Yeah. Sorry, my life. So now, so now we have more problems. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and say for, for my, my Irish brothers and sisters and my Scottish brothers and sisters, Josh didn't know what he meant, but I will point out to an earlier uh, conversation we had, Willie from The Simpsons also has some thick ass hair. So. There we go. And a lot of historical uh, documents point to a uh, very big influence, African influence in the earlier part, creation part of both Ireland and Scotland, considering that it was a uh, sort of, uh, in some ways, a stopping point for trades and uh, merchants. Because despite what history likes to have us believe, uh, history is way older than we think. And all you yeah. got to do is follow literally the money and the spices. Merchants were traveling the world well before we like to say we were doing that. There is that. There, there. I mean, we go deep here on this on this theme, gentlemen. That's, that's, gonna, that's, that's that was just Rashawn, that was just Rashawn saying good morning. That's absolutely yeah. true. Absolutely <laughs> that was just true. Good morning. <laughs> that's, you can you can ask my wife. That is hundred percent true. Yeah, Rashad, that's I just do. saying good morning. I just would add to it the loving and we'll, we'll, we'll say it politely there, but the spice, the money, you know, the trade and, and sex, like, that's it. Like that's history. Like we all like to think, you know, these combinations and all these things and all these cultures, ex cultural exchanges are all new. It's like, nah, people just been doing that. <laughs> My favorite historian answer to why uh, ancient war ended was always money. <laughs> and follow the money without a doubt and there there we go now we're into you know conspiracy stuff and soon i can give you bad medical advice if we keep on this track i love it but star child gregory how you doing today i'm wishing on a star to follow where you are and you know we're, we're ready to do our bit for the beautiful melanated people <laughs> oh, just the way you, the way you said it for a minute i thought you were saying marinated i'm like wait what that was not uh, we, that was not we marinate too that, we okay, marinate too because otherwise yes. that shit's gonna be dry with no flavor so i have no problem with that no you gotta you know absolutely we gotta have the love we gotta have the love of you know and the flavor no matter where it comes from so no matter what way we're talking about so, i just realized like, we we both represent cultures that love to say we're god's people uh, yeah there's that <laughs> like the, i mean we but... we both come from cultures the three of us all come from the the origins that love to say we're god's well, that people comes, we're... that comes from suffering <laughs> there's that you know yeah, it point. comes from suffering it comes it comes from god being your only option because <laughs> <laughs> well god loves me ain't nobody coming to help ain't nobody else coming to help you you know what i mean because if you're the first you know, fr country of free black slaves. Yeah, that's not a way to win a popularity contest. <laughs> and then if you're black people in a, a white dominated country who are like, we want what we deserve. Yep, Ethiopian Jews. Win a lot of points on planet Earth for that one. Can't forget that. And then, it, and then when you are the P the OGs of hatred. <laughs> <laughs> oh geez of hatred you know whenever whenever the test for someone's intellectual prowess is do you hate blacks and jews 
you're going to need someone else's help. <laughs> it's a litmus it's, test, an actual Rorschach. Yeah, test. it's an actual test. It really <laughs> was. Like, tell, tell me what you see when you see this picture. Uh, right? we're, we're, so. we're also representing cultures that love to say we're the original people. Now, there's that too, of course. It, you know, you cling to what you can cling to. I, I always feel like it's, it's just clinging to something in the void, really. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'll take it. I'm not going to doubt it. Not going to tell anyone to stop. But if that's what, what helps you sleep at night, uh, you know, not to hijack the conversation. I, uh, I, will, I will do my best, of course, not to. But I always go back to uh, an old joke that, that uh, an old joke about a rabbi saying, of, of course, God loves us. We are God's chosen people. Just every once in a while, we wish he would choose someone else. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of kind of on that, you know, that's my best thought on that. Since we're, since we're bringing the guy, the conversation led us there naturally, but uh, also just, you know, to claiming my place uh, as, as one of our loyal listeners pointed out, I'm the Jewish guy, always apologizing. I'll, I'll start off with my apologies of the week that I'm sorry, Minnie Mouse. I'm sorry you no longer want to be attractive. And <laughs> you want to dress like Diane Keaton in, in uh, any hall. I'm dating myself with that reference. Uh, <laughs> it was attractive. It was attractive. So there you go. But yes, apparently that's, you know, apparently we're back to this spot in America after my rant on candy and, you know, how I can no longer be sexually attracted to candy. Now, apparently, Minnie Mouse is off the table as well. Uh, is there really any point? Have, can, can we not say the communists have won at this point, guys? I mean, really? We still have candy corn. We still have Daisy Duck. Uh, We're here. For now. For Slippery now. slope. Thanks, Going Obama. downhill. Right. Next thing you know, they're going to be power brokers. They're going to Minnie Mouse will have the right to vote next. God almighty. Who the hell knows? Right. Oh, it'll just be it's just, you know, it's just going to be, you know, not only is she a female, she a cartoon. She can vote. She can vote. She can identify uh, that she'll hell. identify. And, got, you know, by the way, when you talk about identification, what are we going to do with Goofy? Because what's what the hell is he going to identify as? <laughs> right? we don't need I think he's a Goofy. Well, no, he's, he's not. Pluto's no, a dog. Actually, Goofy's no, a cow. Not, not, not touching us at okay, all. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. All right. Just right. I'm just trying to find different ways to make people's heads explode. That's always it. But, you know. Uh, so, yes, that's my apology for the week. My apology to the to all the people who got their their hearts broken by Minnie Mouse putting on a pantsuit. You, you, you have my sincerest condolences. How you how you pick up and how you go on in this world. I, I, I'm still not sure. You know, it, it takes a lot of strength. <laughs> it, it truly does. Your 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 moral fortitude is seen and recognized here um, <laughs> that somehow you can exist in a world where, where Mickey Mouse no longer wears bloomers, as I believe Greg said to me before the show. <laughs> so They're basically bloomers. Yeah, uh, no, uh, you know, bloomers are, you know, I, I was a Civil War reenactor, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm surprisingly familiar with bloomers, but that's a story for another time, without a doubt. Somehow that caused Sarah off kick guard. Shame. No, we don't kick shame here. We, uh, we no. already know that. But it is somehow, somehow your Civil War reenactment history caught uh, Sarah off guard. And the funniest part, I'm like, did it, though? I mean, did it, though? Did, it, <laughs> did, did it, it, though? <laughs> it really. Tell Sarah, I, I, you know, I mean, she listens, so I, we appreciate that. But Sarah, I always uh, I only reenacted Confederate a couple times when we were absolutely uh, had nobody up here because everybody was union. So like we needed mm -hmm. someone to shoot. I almost so. I, I can almost picture you putting on the grays in the same way. Uh, uh, Samuel L. Jackson had to coach and almost course um, Leonardo DiCaprio to say the N word on Django J. That would probably <laughs> like, so be so just sitting like, yo, you just got to do it. You just do it. Do, just do it. Do uh, it. That I would wanna, be, I, all right. I'll play all the great. I'll play all the great. I, I, I would 100% be Leonardo. Yeah. I do feel often when I, I was glad when I heard that story because, yeah, I'd be like, no, no, I would not feel comfortable. I don't care how much you're paying me. This I was glad to hear it too because after Blood Diamond, I'm not going to lie, man. I was kind of like 50 50 on where Leonardo was, but it was, okay. it was good. It, it was is, good after he, Django. He's, a, he's an actor, you know. He's an and, actor, and we so. definitely, um, we definitely need, especially in Black History Month, to spend some time on how your boy Quentin Tarantino, who is talented, I'll give him that, mm -hmm. 
it's really getting to the point where I feel like he's just making movies so he can say the N word. I even going back to Pulp Fiction, it was like, wait, what, what are we? What are we doing? That here? scene, that scene takes me out of the movie every fucking time. I've watched a movie probably a hundred plus. I love that movie dearly, but yep. that scene is still hard to get past. It, it's which, it's, which it's scene? The cut, well, the, the dead body. The, yeah. The, is there a ah. sign? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I saw. And he, you know. and he tries to clean it up, but the way he cleans up is the. It was like the visualization of. But I have a black friend. That like that's the way he totally. cleans it up. Completely, completely. All right, like, let, I'm, let I'm me here with Samuel Jackson. Like, how bad could it be, right? Those, let let like, me let me spin your heads on something because at the same time, I take that movie, Reservoir Dogs, True Romance, right? And you have uh, all of a sudden everybody, you know, a scene where everybody breaks out into an N word fit. Let's be honest, like these guys are, you know, for the most part, you know, let's say uneducated working class criminals. Would you expect them to be PC? No, no, I think you're it, but, I think you're missing my point. Well, no, but I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm like I said, I'm just I'm spinning. I'm spinning. Give mm -hmm. me a second. That, fair enough. Yeah, I'm spinning. You know, so if you know, your goal is to make these guys seem like the occasionally eloquent, but for the most part, low life, hom homicidal low lives that they actually are. Like, I don't know. I never really got taken out of those scenes for that reason. That scene in particular seems a little bit weird because it's like, all right, yeah, this guy seems to be, you know, has, you know, like a good, you know, life, you know, he's married to a black woman, he's got a black friend in the friend in jewels, and that sort of thing. But I mean, didn't we all know that white dude that thought he was that down? Until he got checked. See, Until that's got that's where <laughs> yeah. that's that's where see, I, I don't have a problem with the other movies you talked about for specifically the exact thing you just said. Like it makes sense to me when I'm watching those characters. I, I'm not sitting there thinking they're going to be representing like, you know, their school's UN or anything like that. Right. So I, 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 I'm totally with you in, in that regard. But exactly what you just said about Pulp Fiction, Pulp Fiction is the main reason why I just can't get past. Like, nah, man, you get checked. First of all, if Jules is your friend, how did you not get checked? And then also, if what's his name? Word, yeah. 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 Like, that's like, what I'm saying. Jewels? Like, nah. And then on top of that, how did your wife not check you? Because if you're saying it like that, just out in the open, no, just but letting no. it fly. Rashawn. That woman, that nah, but Rashawn, Josh, give us a second. No, nah, but Rashawn, <laughs> seriously, don't you? Seriously, you ever run into black people who tell white people that shit? Yeah, like they'll yeah. say, oh, no, you can say it. It's yeah. just a word. Yeah. And, I and you was know like, what happens? They run are into you the trying other black to get people his ass who are like, nah, don't do that shit. Don't, yeah, don't do, do that, that shit. shit. I'm vigorously shaking my head on camera. That's all I can say. Look, no, 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 no. I, I, used to, I worked with a dude who, uh -huh. who, who went around telling people that, like, oh, you could say it. It's just a word. It's just a word. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> if he's cool with you calling him that that's up to him but mm -hmm. i would really not advise that you walking up to random black people <laughs> and using that where i would really 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 not advise we try to keep people alive man that's that's really what we're here to do yeah. at tsg and, and similar i went to school i went to college with one of his uh dudes like that the only difference was he was smart enough not to take that advice right. like yeah. the, the man was <laughs> my man was 10 toes down we had this area that was called the dungeon that was literally like uh where all like the black players went to like hang out and shit like that um Dude, would, he would be like one of the one of the two white guys that would be allowed in there. One of the other ones was my roommate. Uh, so like the dude was he was down. He was in the cause. He was down for the cause. He was in the cause. He only dated black women like the dude was like for real with it. But he was smart enough that one time someone tried to uh, trap him with that. He's like, nah. <laughs> he even, he even okay. elaborated. He's nah. like, nah. <laughs> nah, son. <laughs> nah, I'm just going to nah. go ahead and wear my do-rag, try to get these white boy waves and uh you know, right. I'm just gonna call it that. He wouldn't even rock the John B. Thin beard. That's how much I knew he was down for the cause. If yes, you're in the late no. 90s and yeah. you try to hang out with a bunch of black people, but you ain't even trying to wear the John B. Thin beard, now I know you're just trying to be yourself, and these are your people, one way or the other. 
that made more sense and guys showing up looking like John B. It was like, all right, uh, let's let's just wait for you to hear someone tell you you can use N word and then we're gonna see your real character. Well, mm-hmm. I can I can proudly say that I was never uh, I was never that guy who had to be checked, so I can say that much. <laughs> you know? Well done, Josh. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think I have ever. I don't think I ever knew anyone who said you can say it. It's just I've never had that situation, and I would. You know, I feel real sure that I would have said, "Oh hell no, <laughs> just no, we're not going there." That that's not that's not happening. So didn't have to be checked. It did remind me of the uh, of the Donald Glover stand up bit where he was, you know, encouraging white people to use it. He said, by the way, white people, we're going to lose some of you. <laughs> you're, not a, <laughs> you're not all going to make it. But yeah. this is what we need to do if we want to make it that I, I, I still was on the the hell nah. But in case you haven't picked up we uh, on this because I haven't made the official announcement, we are we are celebrating Black History Month here on the steam gentlemen. So we want to have some days. fun. Yeah, we want to have some fun, be you know, some conversations. Hopefully, it won't get too dangerous for me, as, uh, <laughs> as I know that my my two best my two besties here never actually said to me, "You can use that word." <laughs> nope, no, we love nope. you too much. No, nope, love nope. you, love me too much. Want to keep me safe? Uh, that uh, and that's that is not happening. But we are here to celebrate the blackness. We are here to celebrate the greatness of Black history in the month of February. Of course, a cold and short month. Yeah, getting the hard stare on that one, really. I, I imagine if I dug into it, uh, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe there's someone out there who can educate me, us. I don't know about why, why February. Uh, if there is a particular reason, I don't know. Rashawn, you, you stepping up to the mic? We don't have time to go into it, but it is sadly not as complex as you would think, but also is sadly as obvious as you would think. Okay. Yeah. All right. At least, at least I'm not totally missing it. If I was missing something, you know, if I was missing a big historical date or a reason of significance, uh, then, then I might feel bad, but it, the fastest way to summarize it was, it was a small victory turned into a very, uh, a relatively speaking, Big victory that was in moving into a big loss with uh, February being the month. So there's, there's, again, it's not a fast conversation, but that's kind of the fastest way to put it. All right. I, I appreciate that. That was, that was some excellent, excellent giving of knowledge. And I, I appreciate that, but we wanted to start with, of course, the decade of blackness, I think. And uh, one of the best places that you could start if you wanted to talk about Black history, at least the most fun part, and talking about pop culture and social commentary, which is our lane. We try to stick to it within within limits, within degrees. We just we can't help ourselves. It's it's the three of us. But we wanted to start with the 1970s, which is just just such a beautiful time, beautiful time in Black history, and so much going on. So I am going to hand it on off to the Star Child to start giving him his 10 minutes because he was he was our inspiration for this. He was the one who said, you know, it is February, it is Black History Month. Let's do this. Let's mount up and let's let's go for it. So, Greg, what do you got for us today talking about the 1970s? Let's be honest. No one wants to struggle. OK, no one wants to struggle. You know, the whole idea that people, you know, enjoy their victim status, as some people like to say it, I think is a diseased mentality. Nobody likes to struggle. Everybody wants the path, the path most traveled. And you want to have an easy life. And the civil rights movement, as we understand it, now everybody likes to say the 60s, but we're really talking about a struggle that happened from the first day a slave landed in this country. Because whereas you can, you know, enjoy the platitude of, well, that's just the way the world was and people accepted slavery as an institution, you can always assume that yeah, the slaves weren't crazy about it. So we're going to call that part of the civil rights movement, a movement that started at the very beginning and is still trucking along right now as we speak. But the massive, massive eruption that did come in the 60s and that did actually bring real real legislative, social, and economic change led to the 70s, y'all. It went down. Oh, it went down. Oh, yes, it did. And it was a beautiful thing. It was an explosion. Finally, Black people unapologetically, openly, 
creatively got to express themselves in ways that, yeah, some of them were options before, but now suddenly you are the centerpiece. You are holding that piece of your destiny in your hand. And this was new. This wasn't you. This wasn't Black people, you know, trying to figure out if they could go through the front door or the side door. This wasn't Black people waiting for, you know, the pros or for a certain producer or promoter to finally let them in and give them a contract. No, this was Black people creating and demanding. And that is a completely different frame of mind. So you could touch on this in a lot of ways. So I wanted to come out first with the activism. You know, the activism was still very much alive and very important because now it had a sprinkling of Afrocentricity. Now, this was going to cause a lot of this caused a generational rift because you had a lot of older black people who were still clinging on to, you know, the Duke Ellingtons and just thinking to themselves, like, you know what, black people just get a good job. You know, that's like the most important thing we need right now. But then you had Afrocentricity that wanted to blend that in with a real uh, uh, influence and a mixture of the, the continent and the American experience and creating something new. For the first time, Black was beautiful. And you just had sexy afro sexy black skin black people definitely no question setting the fashion trends you had pornography and all of a sudden oh yes that third arm came front and center man front and center and it was in a fly suit it was in a fly suit and it was bulging i tell you bulging on shows like soul train that's right soul train soul train now a lot of people you know you dismiss soul train for one reason or another like it was just kind of a cheesy dance show but at that time yo that was a presentation of black culture like you watch soul train to find out what was hot right now if you, you didn't know, go to church that week it, but you watch soul train you were you watch soul train yeah absolutely like you know what i mean like it was that important at the time people you know they don't appreciate it but at the time if you want to know what was going on in the culture, you watched Soul Train. <laughs> you know, so that was a way for people to finally make it seem as though, I gotta say seem as though, because again, it was still an awkward balance, you know, uh, but seem as though that there was something really significant happening under the surface. Then you had shows like Sanford and Son. You know, you had shows like uh, uh, That's My Mama, you know, and these were shows where the black people were making black comedies for black people. Don't get me wrong. White people were watching them. I mean, you're not going to get on primetime network television if white people at least don't think it funny. But these were black shows for black people. This was something really new. And I'm going to say has only been done again in a few pockets here and there. Like these were black shows for black people. And the music, I mean, stop. I mean, black people from space. I mean, par uh, yeah, Funkadelic. And I'm gonna go ahead and say disco also brought people together and exposed a part of American culture that, you know, people were kind of hoping was going to well, was like dwindle out, but no, it really didn't because music can be such an intimate and personal thing that it really does cross a line for a lot of people. And a lot of people hated disco. And this is when Motown was to, still going too. What's that? Motown was still going too. Motown was absolutely still going, but you know, they didn't have Motown, really Motown record burning <laughs> concerts. I'm sure they burned some Motown records in all of that, but when you had disco, you had, again, the cool blacks. Again, you had the cool gays. And again, you had the women who were coming out and weren't necessarily being available to you. You know, like this was just women being empowered and beautiful and open as well. Yeah, that's not going to go over well. <laughs> you know, so there was a backlash against disco. Uh, you still had the Black Panther movement. You still had the uh, Afrocentricity movement, 
a lot of the older generation, they were concerned that the Afrocentricity and the Black empowerment movement would be just a fashion. And that is something that became a dangerous understanding of civil rights in this period, because fashions are nice. Everybody loves to jump on a bandwagon. But the problem is when the fashion is done, everybody goes home and then leaves the people who really needed that transformation kind of out in the lurch, you know, and that was something that they necessarily hadn't experienced yet. I mean, yes, a lot of the hippies had gone home by this point, um, finishing their degrees, you know, taking over the family business, whatever the case may be. And, um, but uh, you had a you got lot jobs. Yeah, right. But you had a lot of neighborhoods, black neighborhoods and communities kind of falling to the side. So you still needed that economic and social empowerment, which, of course, put a lot of them on the radar of the FBI, uh, most famously uh, Angela Davis, most famously the Black Panthers, like a lot of these groups, they ended up um, in direct conflict with the United States because you had to start social economic movements to empower poor people. And like we said before, you're not going to win a lot of popularity contests in the United States. Even today, you start a social economic movement that empowers the working class, you are the enemy. But, you know, giving rich people more money, well, that's just what you do. <laughs> the, the, the word matter was a great right. far, you know, right? That, that's if, just if you need, what you need any more. You but you know what? It was entirely worth it. It was entirely worth it from uh, film to television, music, sports, Kwanzaa. It was all totally worth it. I am going to make sure I mention two things. One, the welfare uh, movement, the welfare class. I am going to go because I have never stigmatized people on the system or getting assistance or anything like that. You have a country like the United States that has always excelled at exclusion. You had better have something prepared for those people that you put so much work into excluding. I don't think there was anything ever shameful about being on welfare and Reagan's creation of the welfare queen and so on. So you had that movement coming up on the heels of what Johnson and uh, Nixon tried to do uh, with social programs. You had that, and I thought that that was a very, very important uh, component of this because shaming people on welfare just went on for way too long. And this movement tried to make that static. And looking at the legacy of a lot of the um, uh, the Black Panthers and the Black Muslims, a lot of them did try to go to court, uh, get elected, and a lot of them ended up starting a lot of the things, including uh, a clinic, free clinics for the inner city, uh, lunch programs for the inner city, healthcare for the inner city. A lot of those things from started with those social groups. You know, everyone loves the pictures of you know him with the gun, but no one talks about the really important systemic positive things that came out of those civil rights movements. So there's a lot to cover, could go on forever, but in a new way, touched every aspect of American culture. And you know what, America, you're welcome. Absolutely. Yo, yo, yeah. that was just, that was just touching on a piece because all, you also had immigrants who had a new and fresh voice, uh, the disabled who had a new and fresh voice. You had uh, 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 vets who had a new and fresh voice. Like it, it went on and on and on. But that, that was just a little piece. Listen, listen, TSG listeners, uh, I need you guys to understand. Star Child is on a run, probably similar to his icon Prince, where he's just knocking him out. He's just knocking him out episode after episode. It's, oh, I appreciate that. My man, it's just, he's just out there. Uh, I, I think we would be remiss. Uh, <laughs> I think my my dad literally is yelling at me from the afterlife. Um, Black and Beautiful started a little earlier than the 70s. Um, but it's also an offshoot of Black and Proud. And also shout out to Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Uh, two other people I would add that helped with a lot of what Greg said with pushing into the 70s. 
the idea of not only black is beautiful, but I'm black and I'm proud uh, with the ever defiance of the 1968 Olympics and raising what became quite simply one of the most strongest iconic, iconographic, I can't speak today. Uh, kind of graphic. Uh, thank you. Uh, or let's, let me say symbolic. Um, um, Boom motions of the entire movement which is a raised fist and it's so symbolic that not not close to the word but that's also something you're probably going to get checked if you do not have the right credentials and you're not black and you raise that fist in that manner <laughs> you, you, you better have your receipts you know not it's not the same as the word but it's almost on that level of power which is why uh, it's important and goes to the the very eloquent points uh, Star Child just laid down. I mean, my man is lit. He's about to change his name to just literally the symbol of Star Child. <laughs> <laughs> just a star. I think that would be, I think that would be, you know, I, Greg being the graphic artist that he is also could, could design his own symbol, which is the next level of cool. If there is, if there. I mean, there, I'll take that. Yeah. yeah. Actually, my. My namesake, Star Child, you uh, know, from Parliament Funkadelico. So, hey, there you go. Yep, you know, yep. You know, sit, sitting here listening to you, I, I'm the, you know, my knees are knocking as I get to be, I get to be the cream in this Oreo cookie today, going, going up in the, in the middle here. I mean, we might it. as well own that joke. <laughs> we might as well own it, especially this month. Right. <laughs> Without yeah, a doubt. We'll I it. mean. There uh, I am right there. Why, why run away from it? <laughs> get on, get on it, get on in here nice and tight. Just smush me up right there. Just, just kind of <laughs> get on in there, get real comfortable from either side. I'm, I feel comfy. I feel snug and secure. Our uh, listeners should also know this is how it looks on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in that best way but it, you know here i am taking taking my shot coming on in here i wanted to you know thank you both for being here today i did i didn't want to talk about gratitude i think when we're when we're talking about this subject because we are in my favorite decade the decade of my birth i was born in 1974 um so maybe i can't remember some of these things firsthand but it's those it's those impressions uh and just you know greg touched on it and we could talk about it for episode after episode after episode all the amazing things that that came out of black culture in this time uh that still i think are the coolest things i've ever seen um i think you know when you when i heard you talk greg growing up where i did and i grew up in probably the whitest suburb in america <laughs> right I, grew, I, I in a strange kind of existence but i grew up in wellesley massachusetts where you know we did not like you know um it was actually quoted in a movie that said it uh, that said it, it rivaled green acres for ethnic diversity <laughs> was, the, was the quote <laughs> in the movie so that's the case right we you know um and so you know i'm in the bubble right i'm a child grow, growing up uh, you know, when I heard you, when I heard you talking about like the importance of that movement and, you know, our emphasis on this show is pop culture and, and social commentary and where we come from. So I, I, I was, it's such a, it's such a sad truth to say, but I was thinking about the impressions and all of the amazing things, like you said, that were going on with black people taking command of their own destiny and, uh, and also getting this chance to spread entertainment and art in a way that never had before. And here I was such a young child. I, 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 I feel disappointed. I got to miss out on so much of it, you know? Um, but unfortunately, and fortunately you did have, you know, you mentioned Sanford and son. And that really reminded me though, that that was like the first and only chance I was going to get was black TV shows that I was going to get to get any of this exposure. Because quite honestly, here in Boston, we have a program called the Metco program, uh, which caused some stir in the 1970s, if anybody wants to Google it, <laughs> um, where, where, uh, where we were trying, you know, there was an attempt made to try and make education a little bit more equal. But this was truthfully in, in this incredibly white grotto, the only uh, exposure I was going to get to black children, black culture and black, you know, black children my own age at that particular time. Um, but I look back on it, and I'm I'm at least glad that shows like you know shows like you were mentioning existed because I don't think I you know it would have been so easy, particularly in this particular time, 
with no internet, um, being a young child, right, with limited, limited media, uh, I would never have gotten even an impression of what life could have been like or what life was like for other people. I could have certainly gone very well easily into the bubble of this very white, very affluent town in Massachusetts, right? And I've, of course, assumed that everybody lived this way. So when I was hearing you talk about it, you know, you had you had Red Fox, you had Sanford and Son, and you had um, uh, What's Happening, right? Which I always remembered, and I loved. I'd, and truth is, you know, what hooked me was the theme song of What's Happening, right? Because it was just so it's such a '70s theme song. You got to mm-hmm. and, and for our listeners, please go and and Google it. You know, you can YouTube it. Um, you know, but even just that remembering, you know, bong, bong, that huge bass hit <laughs> that hits in the beginning. <laughs> da, 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 da. It, it's everything about it is so quintessentially 70s. But the show that does bring it home for better or for worse is Good Times, right? This was a show that's blowing my little mind. That is absolutely opening up a new world for me. The opening shot is Cabrini Green in Chicago. I didn't even know where that was. My father grew up in Chicago. I think he was the one who told me because I think he knew where it was. He grew up in Glencoe. Um, And it just opens up. It it literally, and thank God it does, at least give me, and we can talk about inaccuracies, accuracies, I understand, but at least opens up a little white Jewish boy living in Wellesley, (laughs) Wasp Central. Thank you very much. (laughs) But uh, it at least opens up the possibility that life is not exactly like what I'm seeing every day, right? That, that, that there are, you know, that opens up the idea of the struggle because good times didn't really pull any punches, right? They're living in a small apartment and they don't hide the fact that they, you know, that you're talking about a black family that is struggling to get by in the seventies. And a lot of the, a lot of the, their struggles uh, um, become front and center to us. Right. And become and at least was a chance, just a chance to start opening up white people's mind to, hey, maybe not everybody in America experiences life the same way that you do. So, you know, there's that gratitude that I'm there that I'm that I was born at that time and that somehow that show made it on the air. Sometimes I still look back and I and I look at shows like that and I'm like, how how did they do that in that particular time? Because we were just, you know. Coming, you know, Jim Crow is is not a distant. It's not a distant memory now, and then it's really not a distant memory, right? It's a, you know, it's only a you know, sixty eight is when the is when the law passes, right? I'm born in seventy four. That's not that long out. Two, four, six, eight, eight years after the fact that you're dealing with a totally different uh, transitional period in law. Never mind in mindset. So I was impressed as hell that 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 a show like that could exist. And I'm grateful that a show like that existed to at least give me some glimpse of something outside of what I was experiencing growing up because that therein lies, lies, the uh, lies of danger. Um, I think it's, you know, I, I, I think it it could take me episodes and episodes to go on about the music that I love from that period, because you, you touched on all of it. Um, I used to think I, you know, uh, I will never forget. I, uh, in the '90s, I was playing bass, and I had uh, my bass teacher really introduced me to some of the the better parts. Yeah, you betcha, of disco, of funk, of soul. And I'll never forget when he broke out uh, Bootsy Collins. Yo, my name is Bootsy with Bootsy Collins and the Rubber Band. And what a what just what a wonderful expression. Now, this is the '90s, mind you, when I'm listening to it and finding out about it. But what an amazing expression of just freedom, right? Of just totally being yourself and getting to bring that to it. You got a, you got a black dude with a huge ass bass guitar shaped like a starburst with big uh, star shaped sunglasses on, huge platform boots right? coming out onto a stage with people dressed just like that. He's the bass player for God's sakes. He was the bass player for James Brown. His uh, brother Catfish is a, uh, you know, is, a, uh, is a guitar player, great guitar player. And just experimenting, and still does to this day, just got announced that he's going to be uh, on Fortnite, actually. He's the uh, characters and, and, and music, him and Bruno Mars, who carrying that tradition on, um, uh, are going to be there. So, you know, here is this, you know, talk about just such an amazing expression and, and freedom, like you say, of being really able to reach into just another world of music that I still love, that still holds up so well. 
And frankly, being the bass player, I started on drums and then moved over to bass. That's such a great period of music because it brings the bass out in a different way. Suddenly it was a cool instrument to play. Um, Around right about the 80s, for whatever reason, it became the it, people got the impression that it was the instrument we know that took why. well, it took no, it took no uh it took no musical talent to play. A lot of a lot of bands started dropping it or using synthesizers and uh, as we call them then keyboards to take over that bass part. But of course, you know, here you just had that just that music, you got that slap, you got that funk that gets rediscovered again in the 90s and pushed back to the fore. And everyone starts asking, well, where did this come from? It all came from the 70s. It all came from the, you know, the spectacle, right? That's the beauty of it. And, you know, I was too young to enjoy it, but God damn, if I could go back in time and do one, you know, just do a couple of things with my young self, somehow I really wish I could have gone to see an Earth, Wind and Fire show back then. Right? <laughs> something like that is just something, ah, uh, I was just too young to even comprehend, right? It just nothing, but God damn, to see this, the, the sheer, spectacle of a show like that or, par or parliament funkadelic you know in, in its heyday uh just to see the mothership land on stage and all those all those artists come out you know it's it's i uh, just in that regard born a little too early or too late however you want to you want to put it but i just it was beyond my comprehension at the time but it, there's no way i could not think about that and you know think about that period of history uh and not be grateful that 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 had happened because it leaves, it, to my mind, still leaves an indelible mark and still something uh, that, that goes on and gives us gifts every day to this day. So I'll, I'll step down from my, <laughs> my uh, 10 I, minutes here. I'm, I'm glad you, you brought up good times because I actually, it was one of the things I left out because I didn't want to take over the entire segment. But yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, but good times was just way too real, way too real. And I was talking about you know, given respect to the people who had to be on the system, you know, like they, I, what I loved about it was like, yes, they obviously were on welfare, but they worked and yes. they went to school mm -hmm. yep. and they were talented and yes. they were intelligent and believed in God and so on, you know, like they were good, hard working Americans that did not have enough, not because mm -hmm. they didn't want it and not because they didn't want to work for it is because there was that understanding again that this part is for you, but this part is not. Right. And that show just showed that every episode and it was beautiful, but it still showed real genuine black love. And that yes. was the thing that really got me, you know what I mean? Like black love, like we're in this tough, tough spot, but we got each other was the thing mm -hmm. about that show that really got me. And Yo, you know, like you live in tenements, you live in a hood. Yo, that shit's real. That that the episode where the elevator broke. Yes. <laughs> okay. All that happened was the elevator broke. But if you you in a you're in like a 15 story project. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You gotta get groceries. You had up the there. incompetent handyman bookman who couldn't do shit, but for some reason he never lost his job. Like, why does this man work here? You know, and mm. it covered just so many real issues that were affecting people. Like Good Good Times was just, in my opinion, the best black show ever. Hey, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, oh, but you know, it shows black people being poor. And I'm like, so fucking what? It shows a, a it shows a real family that got each other when they don't have anything else. Uh, and, and you know that's you know why uh, like i said i i show a lot of gratitude because it opened my mind up even to the possibility and then and, and my mother was even trying to as best i could to explain you know explain to me what was going on because it was mm -hmm. literally a concept out of my head right it was not something i saw every day even by the closest correct me if i'm wrong wasn't bookman always trying to hit on the sister am i wrong on that or was he was uh he, he was always trying to hit on w walona uh, the neighbor Oh, the neighbor. That's who. Will okay. Willona. Willona. Will yeah. Willona. Yeah. Yes. He was right, always right. hitting she was on Willona. Yes. And yes. she would. Yeah. She would and shoot him down. And Willona uh, adopted Janet Jackson's character, right? Wasn't she the one? She took she took her in because her mother yeah. was beating her. Yes. And her mother was beating was, her. And then it was the it was the 80s. The way you brought ratings back up was you brought on a cute kid. Oh, always. Yes. Always. <laughs> 
the mid-season oh, replacement. So. Yeah. But well, I think you also nailed it when you said Americans, because I think that's the thing a lot of people lose sight of when we have these conversations, not just us, obviously, but like in any sort of conversations about citizens within this country, you, it's about also Americans. And, and the fact that anytime you can bring that commonality across, and not me like, oh, it's just this group or that group. It's no, it's Americans. It's, it's funny, funny enough, it's one of the ways I explain Juneteenth. I say it's when some of your fellow Americans got their freedom. You know, like it's people need to understand one way or the other, whether you like it or not, the history dictates who you are more than just about anything else. So yeah, if you are part of a family that has been here for hundreds of years, you're more American than almost anyone else you're talking to. So it's always a talking, we're always talking about fellow Americans. Um, Josh, I also appreciate what you had to say, but I, I would actually beg you to kind of look at it a different way. And the fact that you uh, connected personally to Good Times show the intersectionality of not only that show, but as Greg pointed out, uh, focusing also on main struggles, because the funny part is living in Framingham most of my life, I, I lived around a lot of poor white people. Um, and it's funny how fast they connected to those type of shows than almost anything else, because really what they saw beyond even understanding the race, as you pointed out, not being connected to the culture is, yeah, you know, my parents are on assistance and they're also working and we're also doing all these other things and it's still fucking hard, but you know, those are things, but it's also kind of funny in the sense that I think that's the reason why a lot of people found the moment where Michael Rappenport's the weird other intersectionality of <laughs> Josh talking about uh, good times, Michael Rappenport's character walking away, singing, hustling and surviving good times. And next Friday, <laughs> Like basically all black and Jewish people were laughing at that point or people who were poor. Cause like, yeah, all right. I know that. I know that jingle. And yeah, it probably would be someone like Michael Rappaport that would know that fucking song. It probably, <laughs> it probably would be. Uh, he would. He would. He would. Remy. <laughs> it's a certain amount. Why'd friend. you do it, Remy? Why'd you do it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> that guy can literally be in any fucking movie. He can do any role. He can do whatever. But all I'm going to remember is that you killed Deja. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> I, it, it, you didn't it, have to do it, Remy. You were a I, good kid. You were I a good kid. I remember another just were very fucking awkward. Uh, uncomfortable film, uh, which is Beautiful Girls, uh, right? The, uh, with him and the, um, uh, Timothy Hutton, right? Uh, and and it, uh, a definite cringeworthy watch if you look back on it now <laughs> with, the, with certain things in the Me Too movement and the fact that Timothy Hutton is hitting on a very young Natalie Portman at that point and deciding between Natalie Portman and no bullshit uh, Uma Thurman, right? His fucking dilemma. <laughs> like, well, if, if, we're, if we're gonna look but, at problematic films with Natalie Portman, then you know where it starts. Oh yeah, I this found was, out. I found out this week the original script had been banging. Yeah, yeah, all right. And that's 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 that. And this was after that too. So it's just like, okay, this is a, okay. A what? Uh, oh, this was after. <laughs> this was after the was professional. After? This was after the professional. I think. I believe. Yeah, I'll yeah, double check, yeah. Double check. The professional the, was her first film, right? It was her first film, I think. Yes, yeah, and so. she's supposed to be fourteen. So right, and keep and that in mind, people. They yeah. were supposed to fuck. Yeah. Yee. Anyway, but don't want to don't want to distract from the main subject matter here. So let me steer it on back over, steer it on back over to the three of clubs. Uh, at least let him have his ten minutes here, uh, in, in in his in his gloriousness here for Black History Month. God damn, do I earn that name? Um, the weirdest. So I've always here's the funny thing when it comes to Black History. Um, this is gonna be in itself its own sort of sandwich. So. Um, one black history, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, um, Juneteenth moments like that. I actually find difficult to talk about in mixed company. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is I don't want to spend time dealing with someone's ignorance when it comes to something that is so personally connected and emotionally to me. It's it's something where I don't want to get anger um, during those moments. I, I really try to spin it in either reflection or 
um, some sort of jubilation. Um, I, I come from a family where, yeah, I know we're, we're not the only family. It's kind of a black church thing, but I think many cultures sort of think of it where when someone dies, they don't necessarily call it a, a funeral. They call it a home going. Um, so celebration is near and dear to me when it comes to even somber moments and those moments uh, definitely kick that into gear. So I, I normally re, re, uh, re, keep myself away from any sort of group discussions or group moments uh, other than very small specific companies. And I remember saying this to my wife last night um, and seeing her face because, you know, people, my wife is Portuguese, um, which, yeah, complexion wise is going to make you pretty white. Um, she is, in fact, a, uh, the type of white that when I first met her, I'm like, hey, don't be surprised if you're in a city like Boston, someone's going to come right up to you to speak Spanish and expect you to know it. Um, and she didn't believe me. And then she started working in Roxbury and literally every year for 10 plus years that she lived, uh, worked there, parents would just walk right up to her and just literally just launch into like a full conversation in Spanish. Not like, do you know what I'm about to say? No, just no, I'm talking to a fellow Boricua, so I'm just going to go into it. Um, but I made clear to her that actually, no, it's not a race thing when I say a small, specific company. It's it's more an understanding of where you want to be in either understanding the culture you're about to hear or the appreciation. And then if you want to join in in a similar sort of reflection, then I appreciate it. So I say all that to point out. This is why we're having this conversation, people. This is why I'm comfortable even uh, going into it because Josh is squarely into that group. And I hope that those of you who are listening are also part of this group. So, like I said, this is a sandwich. So I'm going to get away from the sappy shit for a quick second and just point out it is an interesting thing when we talk about black culture to someone like me. Because, all right, I, we're going to talk about birthdays. I was born in 1980. But I was also born into a family where I'm the youngest. I'm not only the youngest of my siblings, I'm the youngest of my entire family. Like literally my name to my grandparents for, I would have to argue the first 15 years of my life was the baby. Like that, that, that was it. It was literally like, <laughs> I, I wanted to point out what my name is, but you're my grandparents. Um, I, I point out many times my grandfather to this day, the man's been dead for almost 20 years. I'm still scared of him. Um, like <laughs> and he didn't do anything to earn that. Like he was just the sternest man. And I, when my aunt told me one time, he actually had a sense of humor and he loved to laugh. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me, man? That man doesn't <laughs> even have the vocal cords for that. Um, so like, it, it's a weird thing, but similar to what Josh was talking about, but an exact opposite. All I actually knew for a long time was just black culture. And it's weird because my parents are actually very much globalists. I've talked about this multiple times. If you looked at any group friend picture that I was in throughout my life, it looked like a Ben and Todd's ad. Like it just, you're, it was, my parents were never like you had to only be around black people yet in the house, all the music that I heard, like it, it blew my mind the first time I heard something like bon, uh, John Bon Jovi, even though I grew up in the 80s, because I'm like, look, I've heard rock before, but I never heard shit like this before. Like, this is out there. This is for real. People are like, nah, man, like Journey and stuff. Like, I'm like, what the fuck is Journey? Like, I remember seeing <laughs> the first, <laughs> I remember I didn't have cable, uh, like I had cable a little bit when I was a kid. And then like, it was off and on, off and on. So when I got cable back when I was like six or seven, I remember seeing uh, uh, one of those, I think it might have been Journey, and it was a music video. And like, literally, it was just a dude like sitting there in the camera, like pumping his fist, and he had his boys behind him. And that was like the whole video. And people were like, fucking into it. Like, they're that, that's their shit. I'm like, I don't understand. Cause what I grew up with was literally all the music these guys were talking about that was in the house. My dad was, uh, he loved music as much as he loved history. Um, so that's all I could hear most of the time. And, and like, I didn't think anything different cause it's good music. So it was like, whatever, uh, TV was a little bit more varied. I talked about, uh, Dukes of Hazard. So if you think that's on the TV screen, at least once you can imagine, you know, it's a little varied. Plus it's not exactly like you could just focus in on the black shows back then. It, like he had three a week. So, you know, you had to kind of space it out and hope you see a black character in some of the other shows 
every once in a while. And I'm going to get to that. Believe me, oh, I'm going to get to yeah. that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when we look at it, but like now I also think about my family members and, and it's funny how like they mirrored the icons that my, my fellow seam gentlemen have pointed out. Cause like to me also growing up, the coolest people in the world were in my family. Like I look at pictures and it almost looked like you can go from a magazine to people in my family where the fashion was literally the same. The, the hair was, uh, hairstyles were in, in, in well kept in the sense of like, everyone just got to the barbershop and then went back to the barbershops. Like, wait, were you guys like there every other day? There's not anything at, like, everything was just so glorious in the, in the black and proud and black and beautiful was just like screaming through everything that uh, either I would see in my, in my family members um, or pictures or things like that. I still have images of just thinking of like my dad and my uncles and some of their friends just hanging out. And it was literally like, a cover of an album every single time. Like someone had, you know, the, the, the flashy car, my dad to the day he died, talk about the Trans Am he had, like he, that was like really his, his first kid. You know, we were just kind of behind that. Um, like all these different things. I, I see pictures of my, uh, my parents and it just looks so damn glorious and shit like that. So all of that was so ingrained when I was growing up that I, I kind of, it's not that I thought all of culture was like that. I just didn't necessarily either separate or think anything different. It was just there. And it would, it, it's interesting to hear other people sort of kind of react to in a way of wishing they had it considering also when you juxtapose it to the struggle that is consistently attached to black America. Um, which further illustrates the, the strength of Black culture, the influence, and how it's moved on. Now, here's where things get kind of steamed gentlemen and weird in the three club style, and the fact that we do not plan this shit. So like normal, I had no clue what the fuck I was going to talk about. I, I just gave you seven minutes of me talking about my family in the sense that it's connected to what I'm talking about, but I don't know. That was kind of filler. This is the reason why I go over every single time. So I'm just going to go really fast. And try to kick this in so the other day josh sent a freaking uh meme we don't have to go into details because i don't have the time but basically my response was war changes a man the reason why i said that is because i always think of this awesome scene in weird science that involves a black bartender and a white kid you may know him you can call him iron man he tries to give him a fake id the id consists of a black man the black bartender's like, so you were a black man in a certain age. He's like, yeah, I was in war. And he's like, you're in war. He's like, yeah, war changes this man. So immediately I'm like, that, <laughs> ah, ah, I love that fucking scene. I love that moment. All that good things. There's so many things about that. Like I can picture my family saying that to a little white kid, like you ain't gonna fuck with me today, little boy. You ain't gonna do that. Actually, that's a funny uh, side story. Again, talk about black culture. My name is Rashawn. I have two capital letters in my name. Black culture is where I start. And my mom stopped teaching because she got to a point where she wasn't going to take it from some little white boy talking shit to her. So anyway, that moment with the bartender near and dear to my heart. So I'm thinking like, yeah, that exists. And, and, and that guy, that, that guy is like in a lot of character movies. So I'm like, I look it up. He's not. So while I'm thinking of this, I'm watching shout out to the comedic review. I forgot who you are, but you do some really cool shit on, um, YouTube, you uh, do movies and you like just talk shit. You're funny. But he uh, brings up my man, Steve James. I'm like, yeah, that was Steve James. Steve James was in that motherfucker. Steve James was the shit. So I'm like, OK, look, I'll go to IMDb. I'll check it out because he was definitely in it. Come to find out he's not the goddamn bartender. Um, by the way, when I was thinking of this, he was doing a thing on, um, uh, I think, Hard Target. Go ahead and watch that, people, because the person he's talking about is also a character actor. That his name is just to give him some love, Willie C. Carpenter, uh, which is going to go to the point I'm talking about. But anyway, so go to Weird Science, go to check it out. It's not Steve James. So I'm a little upset. So I'm like, fuck. So I'm like, am I that person? Am I just confusing just black people left and right? And then I started to think, like, <laughs> one of my fucking favorite movies is I'm going to get you sucker, which is if you want to actually understand real fast what black culture was in like an hour and a half. It's it's a crude representation, but it will give you a summary. And 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 we even referenced it earlier today. We did not plan this, people, but like they all got jobs. That's actually kind of what happened to a lot of the movement. But anyway, watch the movie. You'll get what I'm saying. So I go to IMDb. 
I'm going to get you sucker. I know my man Steve James is in it. He's fucking Kung Fu Joe. It's awesome. Like, yeah, of course he's that. Why is he Kung Fu Joe? Because earlier in American fucking Ninja, when we went through this weird period where we're just going to make white people the martial arts experts of the world. By the way, the 80s was culminated by having movies where you knew the fucking guy could fight when they threw in one Asian guy who's going to fight him. And then the white guy just kicks his ass real fast. Everyone's like, oh, shit, no, he can't fight. But anyway, America, America. So Steve James is in. I'm going to get you sucker and come to find out he actually is in Weird Science. He's just uh, to the side in in that same scene in the bar scene in Weird Science. And which leads me to the last part of this, which I swear to God to Josh, I was going to go to 10 minutes. I'm pretty sure I'm nailing my average of 15. <laughs> so, it goes to the fact that Steve James was in a lot of movies. He, he up until 1994, when sadly he died at 41. Same, uh, Willie C. Carpenter is still alive, but like same thing. He's in a lot of these things, but they're always character actors. Made me also think about the person who makes us laugh. And, and again, I did not plan this, people. I swear to God person who shows up in Friday and next Friday and also the whole series John Witherspoon who's actually his name is John Witherspoon and I weep every time I think about him because the man actually really could act he could act very well and, and a lot of these gentlemen and and, and and ladies could really act and, and I get so upset and I'm getting upset now because they were blocked they were blocked from being able to be to get their craft out i am actually getting upset so I, i'm glad we're talking about 70s and i hope that we can shine light on a lot of these individuals that were so talented and they they, they didn't get a chance well i'm i for one i'm happy that we uh we start on the subject I, and i'm happy we got a couple more weeks to to go with it and see where it takes us and find and find some more avenues and hopefully, well, at least get people started on the on the work that they need to do <laughs> to find that out or maybe educate a few people uh, along the way doing doing our, our, our humble best here. But let, let me uh, well, let me take it back to you then, Greg, as we as we end our first I'm black and I'm proud episode. How we how we doing today? How are we going to going to take it on into the weekend? Um, um, some, some required homework, I'm going to say, <laughs> um, since, you know, uh, uh, the weather's going to suck in most of the country, you need stuff to watch. Let's be honest. So I highly recommend summer of soul. It's a document. Mm-hmm. I think I've recommended it before. I've watched it like eight times. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely amazing. It is absolutely fantastic. Should definitely go, you know, if, if you haven't seen summer of soul, uh, check it out it is uh, they tried to bill it as black woodstock which i guess it kind of is but the truth is if black people tried to get away with what they did at woodstock hey, it opened fire on that motherfucker so it is not black woodstock. they're actually a very well-behaved well-dressed crowd and um that difference is what makes all the difference in the world if you stop and think about it Fantastic. Well, I now now I got something added to my Netflix queue. Easy, yeah, done and done. I think it's on Hulu or Hulu. Hulu. It, you'll find it. Yeah. All it's right. Hulu. You'll find it. All right. I will take it from there. And Rashawn, what do you what do you think you got going this this weekend? So imagine yourself as a five year old. You're just sitting, chilling in a room, whatever. Your dad basically busts in, glorious afro, smiling. If you want to figure out what his smile looks like, look at me smiling. That's exactly what he looked like. Smiling, and he launches into way down in the jungle deep. <laughs> glorified lion stepped on a dignified monkey's feet. Motherfucker, can't you see? You're standing on my goddamn feet. That was my experience. <laughs> that was my life. So I dedicated to the same man who would always make it clear to me that you need to explore every emotion um it is something that is makes you human and in a lot of ways to be able to be vulnerable and and to cry shows that you're a man so i want to dedicate this episode and frankly brought this whole podcast series uh at least for this month to mr warren j smith jr i love you pop and i hope i can be like you well, I think you've more than done that. And I think you, you know, I know you very personally, and I know that respect, he is very respect, proud of you. Respect. Absolutely. Respect. respect. 
<laughs> I just actually made Sarah listen to that skit. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> wait, wait, wait. You mean the Dolomite? No, oh no, no. Oh, no right. I, do- I, I thought you're you I thought you were quoting um Adam Sandler's uh, skit. I think it was in his first CD where it was a group of old men and uh, the little kid comes in and like it was a uh, little Nicky and he goes to visit his grandparent, his grandfather at the old age home and it's a bunch of old, old guys. And every time he says something, all the old guys are like, respect, respect. And then one guy says something fucked up. They're like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I um, just dedicate some to my not. dad, and now I'm all talking right. about Adam Sandler. <laughs> <Not turn around. laughs> well, all right, well, we're gonna we're gonna sail. What about you, Josh? The, uh, me, I'm just gonna be doing my usual bit, trying to keep my kids, you know, on the straight and narrow, keep them from driving me too too crazy. They 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 really enjoy driving me crazy uh, most of the time. That's actually they've discovered that that's become their favorite activity. So, <laughs> and I got and, and you know what? It makes me secretly not so secretly pretty happy. I think they know. Um, so that's mainly keeping them out of trouble, try to keep them on the straight and narrow. We got the usual activities going. I'll try and, uh, dig out of this, you know, not so proverbial shit storm we got going up here. We got a nasty wet mix of, of, uh, New England slop outside. So making sure I don't go ass over tea kettle, um, you know, trimming up this episode, making sure that uh, we are ready for the people and, uh, that it gets out, gets out to the people so that they hear, they learn and that they fight the power and keep moving it forward. Uh, it, if you are here and you are listening to us, uh, for our one Southern listener that's left after last week, uh, and all the rest of you <laughs> who <laughs> may still want to join us, if you will, please go on over to, uh, uh, uh Apple podcasts, iTunes, I guess, Spotify. It's a little dicey right now, but all those places are places you can leave. Well, we're not, for. we're not giving medical advice. That's we're why. not giving medical advice, you know, not yet. Anyway, it's still my dream. Come on. Let me have my dream. <laughs> Look, if you give me Joe Rogan money, uh, yeah, take some aspirin. Hey, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm just asking the question: If you drink nail polish remover, will that not cure cancer? I'm just saying, right? <laughs> Are we really being told the truth? That's all. Uh, <laughs> uh, but if you will, go on over, rate and review us. Help us spread the word. Help us spread that steam. We we really would appreciate. It. I'll leave the link for the merch in the uh, in the episode description. So go on out by the merch fly here. Uh, Greg just did a great design, a Super Mario design. Uh, for the show, which I yeah, like three. Love. You got yeah, I just absolutely love love them all. Uh, so want to want to see those out in the streets uh, and see, see it out there. Uh, and in the meantime, I want you to keep uh, that heat up and keep your head of steam on.